Good afternoon, good morning uh, to those of you who are joining us today. My name is Hugh Taggart. I am the co-CEO of Edelman UK and the global chair of our crisis practice. We are delighted to be sharing with you the second wave of our connected crisis study. Our latest research looked into why businesses are feeling growing pressure to manage core business issues and respond to wider events in society. We have an hour together today. Uh, the first half will be spent with Dave Fleet, our Global Head of Digital Crisis, talking you through some of the findings of our study. We'll then proceed to a panel discussion with experts from across the Edelman business and Denise Gock from GoFundMe to discuss what exactly these findings mean to brands and businesses today. Uh, but before we hear from them, let's dive straight into the study. Dave. Um, right, this is the second year of our Connected Crisis study. Uh, this year, in addition to crisis communications executives, we also surveyed CMOs and CCOs, as well as the general public, including a sample of Gen Zs across six markets, Canada, China, Germany, Japan, UK, and the USA. Uh, the survey was conducted over August this year. Uh, this year's study tells a clear picture of companies grappling with this constant barrage of crises and issues from every angle and of executives feeling the pressure. It also provides a call to action to prepare for what's coming next, to better align with uh, audience expectations in today's crisis environment, and to avoid emerging threats that represent the next wave of risks for companies. Um, We'll start by taking a look at the ongoing turbulence in the crisis landscape and how this is actually impacting the C-suite. So next slide, please, Dave. Um, for the last several years, companies have found themselves almost paralysed, really, between a series of diverse issues from the global pandemic to issues of racial justice and diversity, supply chain issues, then the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, abortion rights in the US, the current energy crisis and now the looming recession. It's unrelenting and it's exhausting for uh, executives to have to deal with. And in this landscape, then, it's really hardly surprising that crisis management has become the fastest growing area of responsibility for CCOs and CMOs. Half of this group say that their crisis responsibilities have increased amidst the rising pressure for hyper-transparency and the pressure for immediate action on these issues. It also highlights that businesses are not sufficiently prepared for this environment. 60% of CMOs and CCOs that we surveyed this year have said that they neither have the skill sets nor the resource to handle these types of issues today. For the second year running, our study reinforces this picture of perpetual crisis. Over the last three years, nearly half the company surveys have, uh, have faced online and social media attacks. Nearly a third have faced supply chain issues, a quarter have faced issues around talent shortages or issues related to diversity and inclusion, and one in five have faced issues related to climate and environmental sustainability. And if we look further ahead, unfortunately, the picture is no more encouraging. A consistently high percentage of executives are really worried about a wide range of business shifting problems, and we'll put these to our panelists later. And they recognise that these issues can have a significant impact on not just their reputations, but also their business operations too. Um, and while some of these key issues, like labour-related issues or supply chain disruption, have obvious broader impact, Crises around cybersecurity, disinformation, activism, they all have wide ranging impacts on a company's license to operate, its position in a tight labor market and other important facets of the business. Um, next slide, please, Dave. Um, now, in this environment of unrelenting issues, it can be really easy to just get caught up in a game of whack-a-mole uh, on the issues of the days. And what happens is that we miss the next planning, uh, the, the next wave of planning for the risks that are coming down the line. Um, this year's study highlights an area that we've seen manifest over the last couple of years, that of issues related to, the ta to talent and the workforce. Think about the great resignation, the challenges that businesses in certain sectors have faced uh, hiring after the pandemic. Uh, an increased level of union activity in the US and also the transport strikes in the UK. So they are really, really manifesting in and throughout the workforce. All of these examples reinforce what the data is telling us, which is that alongside these macro issues like economic instability and political instability, the energy crisis, companies also need to steel themselves for more workforce related issues in the years ahead. As you can see from the charts above, uh, we have gaps of up to 47 points between companies who have faced labour related issues recently and those who are likely to face them going forward. Dave. Okay, so it won't come as a, a shock that societal issues are one of the main challenges and reputational risks uh, that companies are facing en masse nowadays. 
We've seen an ongoing trend in our research in recent years, showing the growing perspective of the general public and of employees that societal leadership is now a core function of business. And this year's study really highlights this, and it highlights the widespread expectation by the general public that companies more actively communicate their stance on societal issues, whether it's on issues related to the economy, to climate change, to mental health, issues of equality, geopolitical issues, a majority of the public is telling us they think it is very important or essential for businesses to respond. And it's interesting to note here on this slide that this reflects the expectation to proactively communicate externally, which is a high bar to cross. In our experience, that bar is much higher than one of just merely communicating internally to employees. Even with this standard, the expectations remain high. And it's perhaps not surprising then that executives are feeling the pressure. Uh, and this year's study reflects this pressure uh, that exists regardless of whether issues are happening locally, globally, or entirely in other countries separate to the company in, uh, in question. Um, and regardless of whether or not they're actually directly related to the business, there are no consistently clear limits or defined scope of what businesses should or should not respond to from a macro perspective, which really introduces a lot more ambiguity into an already challenging space. Further illustrating this, across each of the 22 societal issues that we examined, more than half of uh, chief communications officers and chief marketing officers were concerned about their potential impacts on their brand or company. And many of these issues, it's important to note, are highly intersectional. The US abortion rights debate, for example, opened up issues relating to racial justice and LGBTQ plus rights, climbing inflation rates and economic recession, which in themselves are uh, key concerns for executives, they're also likely to entail additional risk for businesses uh, across this range of, uh, of issues here. Um, and this deluge of issues is leading to exhaustion among executives. They're feeling worn down in many cases by this barrage of complex issues that are demanding their time, demanding their energy, and are leading to difficult internal debates around how to respond. In recent weeks, we've heard from one global CCO about the game of gotcha that ensues as they face questions from employees on why the company is taking on a position on one issue and not another. Another one reflected to us on that the hair on fire decision making uh, process that they went through on pressing decisions. Um, it's perhaps because of these challenges um, that, as we'll see later, we continue to see a gap between executive views on when their companies should engage and the macro level expectations of the public. But sadly for them, that complexity is not going away. In fact, the landscape is getting even more challenging. Suffice to say, in this kind of overwhelming landscape, the imperative for companies to implement the right kind of decision-making infrastructure is really critical. We've worked with many companies over the last year alone to help them navigate different societal issues. And the consistent picture that we're seeing is one of internal turmoil and stress around decision-making on these issues. Companies really need to adopt more consistent, purposeful approaches that streamline decision making, prioritize the right factors in that decision making, drive consistency across issues, and minimize the impact of extraneous factors and personal bias. Critically with these complex nuanced uh, issues, companies need to make sure that they're not relying just on instinct or assumptions as they make their decisions. Two thirds of executives told us that they recognize they need more data to inform their decision making in this area. So there's clearly a gap here. And this finding rings just as strongly across other areas of issues and crisis management um, as well, with barely a quarter of execs saying they consistently use any one data source as they respond to crises. Switching gears uh, for a moment, uh, there's been a lot of industry discussion in recent years around the impact of Gen Z on the marketing space, but less on their impact on the crisis and reputation management space. So this year we decided to take a closer look at the impact of Gen Z on this space. Note that while Gen Z is often considered to extend as young as those uh, of 10 years old, for the purpose of this report, when we talk about Gen Z, we're defining that group as being between 18 and 26. So when we talk through the findings and the implications of these, we're talking about people who are graduating from school, entering the workforce, making purchasing decisions. And this slide nicely summarizes our findings in this area. Gen Z is driving significant change in companies. Almost two thirds of CMOs and CCOs told us that more than any generation, Gen Z has the power to disrupt the role of business in society today. And this impact is especially pronounced in the USA, in China, and in Canada. And in the US, 80% of execs agreed with this statement. 
execs recognize the heightened expectations of Gen Z in this area. Gen Z is challenging companies to maintain higher standards, both in their response to crises and in their expectations around societal issues. They're expecting companies to lean in more uh, than other generations do. They're also changing the face of activism. They're outflanking companies through new approaches, new channels, and in doing so, they're challenging long-standing corporate approaches to crisis management and forcing companies to examine their ability to move quickly in new ways. And while their behaviors and expectations do uh, represent an evolution from those of millennials, they are a stark divide uh, when we look at the gap between uh, Gen Z uh, and Gen X. Simply put, this generation is throwing companies off balance. Uh, as I noted earlier, their social media habits differ from those of older generations. Uh, those, uh, those habits make issues harder to identify. It makes them at times harder to mitigate. They scrutinize companies more closely, holding them to higher standards and causing uncertainty around those expectations. And given that Gen Z really represents uh, often the younger members of the workforce, the generational gap here between senior marketers and senior communicators and this group means that Often absent a concerted effort to try to understand this group, we run the risk of misunderstanding what they expect of us. In the face of this, tried and true approaches to crisis communications and reputation management may be less effective with this group. It means experienced crisis communicators need to be willing and able to adapt their thinking uh, and to adapt their playbooks and to make sure that they're hearing directly from people in this cohort so that they can better understand their perspectives. Remember, again, this group nowadays has purchasing power and they also have growing power in the work, workforce and in the workplace. Consistent with our recent trust in the workplace study, we found that this younger generation is expecting more of their employer too when it comes to taking a stand on societal issues. In fact, more than two thirds of executives say that taking a stand on societal issues and environmental issues has become a must to attract Gen Z. In light of the earlier findings around talent and labor issues, companies should take note of this. And despite everything we've said about executives' trepidation around Gen Z, they do still continue to underestimate the expectations of this generation on societal issues. Across multiple issues, as you can see on this slide, from social mobi uh, mob mobility, for example, immigration, uh, gender equality, racial justice, and more, Gen Z expects more than executives recognize by up to a 33-point gap. And this generation is acting on those expectations. There is a business opportunity here in taking a stance on the right issues, and there is risk in taking the wrong stance uh, or not taking a stance. Gen Z follow their beliefs and they respond in their purchase decisions. And across 20 plus issues that we explored in this survey, more than half are saying that they have acted on these beliefs. Across every one of these issues, Gen Z says that they either will stop buying from brands because they did not take a stance on an issue, or conversely have started buying from brands because they did. And if they disagree with your stance on an important issue, half will not buy from you, even if they like your product the most. So simply put, if you remain silent on the wrong issues, this generation will sanction you. And if you take the right stand, they'll reward you. So in this environment, what can brands do to protect trust in times of crisis? And it's here that we have um, yet another challenge and in fact, more tension. The perspectives of executives are not aligned to those of the public. And we'll show you why over the course of the next uh, couple of slides. Let's first look at the behaviors that are expected of businesses in times of crises. Our study clearly reflects that Almost unanimously, the two most important traits that the public expect companies to demonstrate during a crisis are integrity. So does the company and its executive, uh, executives act with honesty and dependability? Does the company keep its promises and stay true to its commitments? Uh, we see a slight difference in China, but the two traits remain in the top three. Now, this might seem obvious, but it's not in line with the way that companies are looking at these particular moments. And as you see here, actions matter. No matter how important societal and cultural issues are to people, they matter little if the company is not honest and dependable or good at what they do. And this speaks to the stat that you see on the right here, reflecting that executives recognize that they are not able to consistently empathize with their stakeholders by starting with their point of view in times of crisis. CMOs and C, uh, CEOs in particular need to better align with these expectations with honesty, ranking only midway in the list of perceived trust building traits versus the top for the public and being good at what they do ranking at the bottom of their list. So what does all this mean for us 
uh, our clients as communicators. Um, firstly, companies need to match the increasing importance of crisis communications in the role of the CCO and the CMO with appropriate resources, both in staffing and the attention given to planning and training reflecting today's crisis landscape. Secondly, uh, we're already starting to see labour related issues manifest in a variety of crises uh, for companies across multiple industries. Companies need to place a concerted focus on building trust in the workplace, bringing your values to life and uniting the workforce around your purpose if they are to mitigate their risks around these matters. Uh, to quote the recent trust in the workplace study, to earn their trust, give them yours. No matter, now more than ever, I think, our studies have certainly showed the role and expectations of employees and the importance of building and maintaining a trusted fair process. Thirdly, it's time to acknowledge that expectations around societal issues are not going away and to move beyond these ad hoc approaches that lead to really destructive circular debates in the workforce, inconsistent approaches and short sighted decisions. Companies need to build the infrastructure to make decision making around these external issues a part of normal business practice in order to manage risk and minimize disruption to the organization. Four. The impact of Gen Z is only going to grow as they progress in their careers and they in turn bring increased buying power, cultural impact and work, uh, workforce influence into the picture. Companies need to evolve how they approach crisis in light of this. And this does not mean throwing everything out uh, and starting afresh, but it does mean that they have to evolve insights, scenario planning, preparation and how to execute quickly and effectively across new channels and dynamics in the face of the new risks that this generation is introducing. And finally, organizations need to take a considered look at the ways they're looking to protect trust in crisis and better match their actions with the expectations of younger generations. Right, that's it for uh, the, the report and the insights that have been drawn from our most recent study. Um, I'm going to now bring in our panelists. Um, let me introduce uh, Denise Gock, uh, Senior Director of Corporate Communications at GoFundMe, uh, Amanda Edelman, who's the COO of Edelman Gen Z Lab, Sydney Roach, Global Chair of Employee Experience at Edelman, and Andrea Hagelins, uh, Managing Director of Societal Issues at Edelman. Um, Welcome to you all. Thanks very much for taking the time. Um, Denise, I'm going to come to you first. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the changing nature of crises in business and particularly in GoFundMe. We've just seen that two thirds of CMOs and CCOs say that they don't have the right skill sets in their team to navigate some of these challenges that they're seeing today. And that there's this extreme diversity of issues that companies now have to manage. Tell us a little bit more about how that manifests at GoFundMe and the types of skill sets that you need now to manage crisis today? Yeah, I mean, I've been in communications for more than 20 years now, and a lot has changed in terms of the type of skills you need on the teams. Um, you know, it used to be where if somebody, if a reporter had a story about something that was either brewing or something that was becoming, would be a crisis, you had, you almost had like a day to understand the situation and figure out what needed to be done before the paper goes to print. Um, clearly, that's not the world that we live in anymore. It's a lot more chaotic and people are looking to a lot of different um, sources in this in this digital era. But, um, you know, back then we could make call downs to beat reporters and explain the situation and help, you know, arm them with the accurate information. Um, now we, you know, communicate in so many different ways. We communicate within our product, um, the yeah. GoFundMe platform. If somebody is trying to do something, set up a fundraiser for something that's, you know, for instance, no longer within you know international laws as was the case with afghanistan when people were trying to raise money for people who were evacuating but taliban was seizing certain areas so it was no longer um the same activity that was happening on the platform and acceptable on the platform before it was no longer we had to communicate to the people who were trying to start those fundraisers before they did that so we have to base we have to look through a 360 degree lens right um and talk directly to our customers we do rely a ton on the media um, we just we have to make sure that we're communicating, you know, from all angles. But in terms of the um, skill set and expertise on the team, I think the most important thing right now, particularly as we deal with a lot of world crises, whether it's you know the devastation that a hurricane causes or war, as in with Ukraine, um, you know, we really need to have people who can activate a cross-functional team quickly because. With every crisis that we deal with, there is um, a legal component. There is a product 
component. There is communications component, marketing component. So ev ev there's, it's all hands on deck. So we've got a really tight crisis playbook that we already have so that anyone can jump in and be helpful and, and be part of the, the solution. Um, I think that's, I think people underestimate the value of that because often it takes a lot of time to build a thoughtful crisis playbook um, and one that can be applicable to a lot of different types of crises, yeah. but we rely really heavily and it's very prescriptive. Um, so that's been really useful, but we, we also look for people who can really, um, it's important to decipher noise from signals. Right. And, uh, you know, you guys, Edelman does a really good job of that with particularly relying on the tools that you guys have um, to help sort of filter through that. Um, and then just people who can, you know, really quickly assess a situation and understand quickly a business landscape that may be outside of the particular sector that your company or product is in. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like a willingness and an ability to learn new things quickly and figure out what you need to discard and what you need to um, bring into the into the picture. Um, yeah, and I think also you just need the right tools. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to ask um, to just, just probe a little bit on the on the capabilities. Are you hiring people with with sort of non typical comms backgrounds? Are you looking into the sort of legal world, into the cyber world? Um, for people with different skill sets that can face off against some of these challenges as well. So has the profile we're, of the person changed? Yeah, we're, we keep a very um, open mind in our recruiting process because I'm a, I mean, I'm a big believer that you can, if you have sort of these right characteristics that you can adapt or learn quickly, um, some of the other things that you may not have experience with. Yeah. And, and what about just in terms of the, uh, the, the, the resource that you're allocated? Do you feel like at the start of every year that you have to go into bat and ask for more resource, more money, more investment to actually do this? Or does the company sort of look at this at, at communication? See, this is a real business enabler. It's also the front line for some of these, for some of these issues. And therefore, you've, you've got the types of people and the team that you need to actually face off against these issues. We, we do, um, we do, and people recognize the, the role that our team plays and how critical it is to the business. Um, we, uh, you know, we do have, like, as, as the world gets even more complex on a daily basis, I, 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 I think that more people throughout the organization understand the value and yeah. um, the need for the communications function. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask Amanda now about Gen Z and about this this audience that's really challenging business and I think consuming information in a different way expectations are vastly different to perhaps some of their predecessors um, and I think you know Dave mentioned it in one of his slides talking about they're really imbalancing business or throwing them off balance why do you think there's such a gap Amanda between expectations of Gen Z and the actions of businesses today Absolutely. Well, I think it's a couple of things. So number one, business on the whole fundamentally misunderstands Gen Z. A lot of our data shows that business leaders believe that Gen Z is out to cancel them, believes that Gen Z is all out to be influencers, and these are the fundamental motivators of Gen Z. What our data actually shows is the fundamental motivators in Gen Z is safety and security, which for me and a lot of our clients that we've spoken to about this is absolutely mind-blowing. And so when you think of Gen Z's actions and frankly their demands through a lens of safety and security, a lot of them start to make sense. If they're advocating for higher wages, if they're advocating for sustainable supply chains, it's coming from a lens of, I'm not gonna be able to afford a home in the next 40 years, so I need to up my pay. I'm not gonna have a planet to live on in the next 40 years, so we need to make our supply chains more sustainable. So the cause and effect and sort of the understanding of the motivations there are totally different. Um, the second thing I want to highlight is that Gen Z absolutely has higher standards for Gen Z, um, both with respect to prior generations and also, I mean, as you and Dave noted, there's huge gaps between what businesses believe that they need to be doing to respond to societal issues and what Gen Z believe businesses need to do to respond to societal issues. And I think, I mean, I think it's a couple of things. Number one, broadly, our trust data shows is that there's a lack of belief in the efficacy of government. And so, and, and therefore an increasing belief in the efficacy of business. 
Um, and if I just look at COVID, for example, you look at who stepped up to the plate, it was businesses, it wasn't government. And Gen Z is acutely aware of that. And I think the second thing is that if you're a young person, you're looking at what's in your span of control. Obviously you can vote, but really what's in your control is where you spend your money and where you spend your time. And how, is that, how that's laddering up is with employers uh, and with consumer products. So I think both of these themes sort of uh, lead up to this massive difference is that Gen Z is looking at a totally different society and world that we live in. And that's really informing a lot of the expectations they have around business. Thanks, Amanda. I'm, I'm going to come back to you and Denise at some point to talk about the tools um, that we need to, to reach Gen Z and, and, and the digitally native audiences as well, and how we can be a bit more targeted in terms of our responses or indeed just reaching out to them to sort of proactively mitigate against some of these issues as well. So give that some thought before I come back to you. I'm going to ask Andrea um, now about you, you advising some of these businesses navigating really challenging issues today. Um, and as Amanda has said, the expectations have changed around the role of business and what they need to do, how they need to communicate during times of crises. Um, I'd love to hear your view on what companies should be committing to, what companies should be talking out on, and where are companies sort of having those missteps? Um, tell us a little about some of your experiences advising companies um, navigating some of these challenges. Sure, I mean, I think we have seen in the United States um, no more of a, you know, a moment around this than the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, candidly, five years ago, to have a CEO say the word abortion, that would never have existed except for in the, you know, right. the my, most minor, you know, companies or, you know, progressive areas. And um, the reality is that because of the changing expectations in part of, particularly of employees, there is new demand and pressure um, from Gen Z, from others, uh, to really engage on topics that historically have been outside of the business thinking. And, and that's resulted in the fact that, you know, over the past five years in particular, I think companies now have to think through an actual framework around how to engage on these issues. I mean, we all saw that list. That list of issues is daunting and it would take up your entire day instead of the actual work that you need to be doing around the company. And so it's really important that CEOs, CCOs, boards rethink the role of business because the expectations from our trust barometer show that businesses are going to be leading on societal issues for years to come. And so now is the time to really think through a way to operationalize that and create a model using either, you know, our societal issues navigator or other tools that you might have um, to, to evaluate where and when to engage and to also not assume that it has to be a binary response, either complete right. silence or completely proactive, um, that there's a whole range. And I just want to talk about that a little bit, just in terms of audiences um, and, and how a sort of set of filtering questions can, can lead you to the, to the right response. But um, one thing that Denise mentioned um, in, in, in her first response was about the media and the sort of, in you know, not so long ago, the, the first response and the first audience that we needed to consider was just the media. Um, but now it's very much stakeholder first now. And I, I just want to talk to you a little bit about it the role of audiences and the role of tools and how we define who we go for first, how we respond. Um, how has that changed? And 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 how does a, a tool like the Navigator help companies um, arrive at some of those decisions? Sure. I mean, I think, one, we know that you need to have a more diverse set of stakeholders in these conversations. It can no longer yeah. just be the CEO and the, the board having these conversations, particularly because oftentimes it doesn't re reflect the diversity of your audiences in general. And so, you know, ensuring that you have that employee perspective as well as your customers and others. And then thinking through, you know, where your priorities are at that moment as well. We saw, you know, in the wake of the pandemic, there was a real shift in terms of fears around losing top talent. Well, that may mean that in that moment, you know, those considerations are gonna be weighted more prominently than, than other considerations. So it's it's a fine you know line to walk, but you have to be constantly in conversation with all of your stakeholders to understand where they are on a certain issue. 
Yeah. Uh, and Sydney, it's probably a good um, segue into the role for the, the employee. It's, it's tough being a CEO today. It's, it's, it's very tough. Right? It's, it's tough. Very, very and they're, they're, they're grappling. And it's not, just the, it's not just the CCOs and the CMOs, right? It's the, it's the CEOs as well. So what's the role for the employer in, in all of this? And how are they grappling with some of these issues? Yeah, actually, I, I, not only the CEOs, it's also the CHROs and the board. Yeah. The board yeah. has never been juggling so many issues because with this lack of trust in government that we know from our separate research and um, other institutions, so much has come home to roost in the, the lap of the employer. So we, I, I was presenting at a CHRO conference last week and uh, they are overwhelmed uh, with all of the issues that they're now expected to manage and track. And um, so that will get to some of the suggestions that I'm gonna make here in a minute, but yeah, indeed. Um, and we have some adjacent uh, Edelman Trust in the Workplace data that tells us 70% of employees globally fully expect their employer to connect them to work that has more meaning and social purpose, to reflect their own values, but go beyond to demonstrate a greater sense of purpose in society, to stop business practices that employees um, don't believe in, and for the CEO to speak up on controversial issues. But, you know, I get this question asked every time I present trust is, you know, which, which issues do I take a stand on? So I'm sure Dave Fleet will be happy to speak about our own Edelman social issues navigator, which is really, really, really helpful to that end. Uh, I will say again at that Aspen Institute conference where I was last summer, Every CEO who spoke there or every head of DEI or CHRO or CMO was saying that increasingly they have to really take their organizational purpose. And by that mean like that, that, that what we, how we define organizational purpose and they were defining it is an expression of long-term strategy that also has an impact on society. So aligning your purpose, your vision, your values with your business mission, using those as a compass or a filter to make those really hard decisions about which societal issues to speak up on. But you also need to take a really specific look at uh, workforce segments sentiment because there's an increasingly a divided workforce that reflects the divisiveness of society writ large. And then you have to use all of that sentiment and sort of map it. And it's a stakeholder mapping at a very complex level, but use that mapping and that sentiment to inform planning and communications. And as a side note, what's really important when you think about Gen Z as one of those workforce segments, um, you know, sometimes people say, oh, it's just the Gen Z that only that is concerned about social issues in the workplace. And while they have a very large interest in that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. She can probably speak to this very knowledgeably that um, Gen Z exerts what we're calling this gravitational pull on other demographics in society, but also in the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sydney, for teeing me up. Um, we're calling it a gravitational pull because they have so much influence across how other generations believe and act in, in many levels. Um, but specific to the workplace, so the general population, 63% of them says that Gen Z influences, deeply influences um, things in the workplace. And what's very interesting and pertinent to this is that 62% of the general population believes that Gen Z influences how employees uh, how employers, excuse me, engage on social issues. So both of those stats, you know, nearly two thirds of employees believe that Gen Z is changing the game within the workplace and broadly how employers respond to social issues. And, you know, given the stats that we just discussed, which Gen Z believes that employers need to be more active, more decisive, more vocal um, on social issues, it's no, uh, it's no surprise that broadly businesses are expected to enter the fray, sort of led by Gen Z and the influence that they have. And it's really, really important from an employer point of view to remember, this is your workforce of the future. Uh, that demographic age 14 to 24. Uh, I remember when I was uh, doing some work in professional services and advisory, they did a lot of research on how to start attracting and retaining because no, nobody grows up saying, I want to be a consultant that's like, you know, astronaut, cowboy, consultant. So they were doing all this research and they found that in order to really attract and develop a pipeline of talent, they had to start 
talking to kids when they were in junior high school, 14, middle school, 14 and above. So uh, Gen Z workforce of the future, you got to start engaging them very early. Absolutely. And just one more thing that I want to add to that is that when we look at the issues that Gen Z cares about, it's much more uh, human centric. So they care about things like racial justice, gender issues, LGBTQI rights. Um, and that's because Gen Z is in fact the most diverse generation. So for many of them, these things are not nice to have. These things are urgent and intrinsic to who they are. Mm -hmm. so the demographics and sort of the shift in demographics, frankly, among Gen Z is also influencing the types of social issues that uh, employees believe that workforces should speak out on. Yeah, I, I, Denise, I've seen you nodding um, mm -hmm. during Sydney's and uh, Amanda's responses there. I mean, just talk to us a little bit about how this manifests at GoFundMe. I mean, we see it at Edelman. We see this sort of being challenged on uh, our approach to some of these societal issues as well. And, and that's a good thing because it's setting a high benchmark. It's, it's making businesses engage. How is that, how is that manifesting at, uh, at, at GoFundMe? Yeah, I mean, every company is is um, grappling with this a bit or sort of navigating this. But I would say that if you don't have employees or even customers who disagree, then something's wrong with the world, right? I think we're we're supposed to have we're supposed to have di diversity uh, in every way. So, yeah. um, I, I you know one of the things that I, I'm nodding because one I have a, a Gen Z at home. Um, so I, I study that <laughs> the generation quite a bit. Um, but one of the things that uh, I've, I've, we've really focused on as we communicate with the people who use our platform, who fall within that generation is like the basic tenets of communication is, is what is appreciated. And we have a real, so like no BS, speaking with clarity, using plain language, whatever language that is. Um, and just, we were really, lucky in that we've got a, a very solid mission at GoFundMe, which is to help people help each other. Um, and so we ask ourselves that question every time we communicate on something that um, we know is important to our users. Like, am I being helpful in this response? Am I being helpful in managing this with our, with our customer this way? Um, is this helpful? And if it's not, and if it's only helpful to us as a company, then we need to change our approach and we need to, yeah. to act differently. I think authenticity, you were, uh, authenticity is one of the things that is most, and Amanda, keep me honest here, but as an authenticity and um, uh, being very genuine and tone and, and content and intent is super critical to that um, generation as well, to everyone, but especially important to Gen Z. Yeah, and I, I think Gen Z's probably got a, a different view of media too. I mean, this this came out in the in the study as well, um, because it would appear that there's a disconnect, right, between what other generations see or view as media and what this generation, the Gen Z, is view as, uh, as as media. Amanda, it's probably worth just talking a little bit about how agile businesses need to be to communicate across different platforms. Um, Who's who's getting it right? Um, if you can sort of have a look at a, a business or a brand, who's you, you come come back to that? But just talk a little bit about perhaps how businesses need to be a little bit more agile, a bit more digi digitally focused than than previously. Yeah, Hugh, that's a phenomenal question, and it's one I've been getting a lot. And and what's interesting is that from clients, the question I get is, "What media does Gen Z consume?" That's always the question I get, and I tell them, "I'm like." I am gonna rephrase your question. It's actually, how does Gen Z consume information? How do they consume media? And really that's the biggest shift is instead of looking at channels like traditional media, social media, it's all one thing. And that's the biggest piece of advice that I've been telling clients is that the way that Gen Z receives information is 95% through social channels, primarily through social channels. And then they'll use those social channels to sort of link back to traditional media sites, to digital media, but it's all through social. Um, and it's a little, it's bizarre, honestly. It's, it's the first way, um, or it's, it's a really big change, honestly, to think that you'd need to be your traditional media outlet, to think that you need to reach an audience on TikTok is, is a little absurd, um, but it's, it's generally the way that Gen Z uh, mm -hmm. receives and consumes information. And the other point that I'll say, 
and this um, is deeply related to crisis, is that Gen Z shares information more than any other generation. Yeah. So with Gen Z in particular, news travels like wildfire. Um, and as a result, you need to be really tight in what you say and how you present it because it's going to spread much more quickly, uh, which can be to your benefit, but also can be to your detriment if it's news that you don't want to travel. Speaking of TikTok, I was so, so proud to see our wonderful CVS client. They have a, a, a brand um, identity that's about connecting and helping hearts. And uh, the employee, from an employee perspective, it's helping heart behaviors. And uh, I was scrolling through TikTok the other day and I saw CVS because Gen Z especially loves to be, um, connect me around a purpose, connect me, connect us, help us connect ourselves around uh, a purpose or a mission. And they were doing that on TikTok and some of their helping heart initiatives um, that are tied to community. It was really, really great to see that on TikTok and like tons of energy around it on that platform. Yeah, interesting. I I, I just wanted to um, ask Andrea a question um, uh, about something that Denise said. Denise said that they communicate with no BS, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the findings of the study showed that there was a disconnect between what CMOs and CCOs think they should be doing during the course of a crisis. And yet the public's expectation is completely different. They want no BS. Right. They want integrity. They want the commitments. They want dependability. Why is there, why is there a gap? I mean, I think it's a couple of things. I think, you know, we have been trained up to not never speak uh, negatively in any way and sort of like think, oh my gosh, if I have to acknowledge that this issue, then that means I'm gonna have to acknowledge all the past missteps we made on this issue yeah. as well. And so for many of us, I'm Gen X, so I'm in the notoriously cynical crew. Um, you don't wanna acknowledge those things, but the reality is the expectations have shifted. And so for example, if you want to speak on gender equality and you're thinking you're gonna go out and speak on Women's History Month, you better know what your pay equity policies are as well. And, you know, either pre be prepared to right some wrongs and acknowledge that publicly, or, you know, really think through what that plan of communication is because you are going to be called out instantaneously. And it'd be much better to change the policy and, and move forward than, you know, to deal with it on the back end, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's, I, I think this is a good thing because you develop a sort of a more symbiotic communications relationship yeah. with your with with your stakeholders um i should at this point invite um anyone uh who's listening to this webinar to to feed in any questions they might have for the panelists um we've got a, a few minutes left but it'd be great to hear from some of the clients and people that are joining the call today um perhaps while they give some thought to some of those questions sydney uh, what can we learn from some of the the, the mistakes <laughs> that, that companies have made and, and this is not to put brands in the you know in yeah, the spotlight no, no. so to speak but this is more about you know some of the principles perhaps that haven't been adhered yeah. to and and, sure. and why they've got it wrong and then but also like th th these are these are these issues can really affect license to operate it can affect yeah. customer behavior it can affect employee sentiment right so what can we learn from some of those who have misstepped well, from uh, an employer perspective, in almost every single case of companies who've gotten it wrong, they've, they've just ignored very loud, very clear uh, signals coming in uh, in advance of uh, a crisis. So yeah. written complaints to HR, verbal pleas to direct managers, social media posts, very, very public social media posts citing extreme dissatisfaction around a company's stance on an issue or silence on an issue. But employers are finding it super challenging to monitor all these incoming signals in a really meaningful way. Um, right. You know, for example, the CCO of the world's one of the world's largest technology platforms uh, reached out to me this past summer to say, you know, I can analyze employee engagement surveys, I can take pulse surveys, but he said, I just feel those are the tip of the iceberg, and I need to get to the massive part of the iceberg that's underwater. And right. you know, now there are really proven methods to complement 
surveys and focus groups, which I, I have to say have some inherent bias in them. Um, we can complement those with ethically curated data and analytics that track, I would call it like the, our research team calls it the volume and velocity of employee and sentiment on key issues in this um, always on warm data kind of way. And, and then complement that again, with a uh, worker voice. So in the last 18 months or so, couple of years, this concept of worker voice, which is not just internal comms, two-way feedback loops, but like really uh, seeking the voice of the worker and creating pathways for that voice, that input, because I mean, employees have so much knowledge on operational and strategic uh, aspects of a business, but a Gallup survey said that only 30% of them have an opportunity to share that in any meaningful way. So finding pathways for that employer voice, the worker voice to reach governance levels. So we at Edelman, for example, have a partnership with Aspen Institute to explore that in a trust forum and a worker voice lab. So putting that all together and creating a meaningful dashboard around it. So you have the employee sentiment gathered from surveys, a little bit of bias, some uh, curated data that's really social listening and scraping in an ethically curated way, complemented with this worker voice. You can actually create a dashboard that's always on and live and helps inform. Yeah. You know, if I could jump in, uh, yeah. one area that I think we haven't touched on, but I think is top of mind for at least many of my clients is the state of punitive politics, particularly in the United States right now. And the fact that, you know, you, you have this demand to speak out on issues as we've seen, but we also have to recognize that there are states and lawmakers that are targeting companies um, for those policies, yeah. most particularly ESG right now. And, and this is a, you know, I come from politics. That's where I've spent the bulk of my career. That is designed to have a chilling effect mm -hmm. on these policies and these statements. And so I think, you know, again, what I'm hearing most often is this um, sort of anxiety about then, well, how can we even think about doing this? And so there's, there's, a increasing tendency to bury head in sand. And again, I would go back to, this is why it's really important to, to uh, going back to what Denise said, have people on your team that think outside the box that are curious about these issues and are collecting that intel or, or work with an agency like Edelman where we collect intel on the issues and how they're um, activating. And then thinking through that framework because um, you're sort of in it regardless and it's better to be on that front foot rather than reacting in a crisis. Yeah, um, Denise, just in terms of the, the building blocks, right? So you're building a crisis team or you're building a communications team now. Uh, you know, we, we saw some of the, the insights out of the study that said, you know, it, it's not about throwing everything out, but it's about evolving the, the the approach what would you sort of say for for businesses that are grappling with this how do you evolve that communications function so that you've got the the right sort of building blocks in place to to face off against some of these issues today yeah we have um we do a couple of things one we will have people who have been at the company for a while but not in the communications function and so we sort of have this uh, we have a very diverse team in every way so we'll We'll welcome people onto our team and they're already up to speed on the business and, and the customers and how the platform operates and how we operate as a company, but new to communications, but they're able to give us a different view um, on situations because they're not, they haven't traditionally thought about things through the communications lens. So um, I, I, we really do um, like to have a diverse group. We do like most companies now, I think we have former reporters, journalists on our team um, and we have just, I, I think the diversity of background is, is, and experience is really important. Yeah. I, I, Amanda, um, just from, from your side, that sort of balance and the channel ag agnostic ability, just in terms of companies wanting to reach Gen Z, um, given this is going to be an increasing, uh, increasingly large percentage of our workforce, what are the building blocks that you would encourage brands to, to build into the in, into the function? Yeah, that is a great question. It's sort of, because for us, it's we have the data that gets these motivators and then how do you action those insights is really the, the rub of, of what we do. 
Um, and for me, it goes back to something that Andrea said, which is companies, uh, companies' actions need to align with their words. Um, and the example, Andrea, that you gave is, okay, if you're present in um, Women's History Month, you need to have pay equity. And for me, that's actually the biggest thing on these social channels is that when you're making statements, you need to have your actions and your policies align with your words. Um, Gen Z is incredible fact finders. We call it their forensic ability to uncover the truth. Uh, and this is a generation that's grown up with smartphones, that's grown up in the internet age. They've been bombarded with information yeah. for their entire lives. Um, so they're really, really good at finding out information. So for me, the biggest recommendations are number one, um, again, ensure that your actions are aligning with your words. And then number two, um, uh, ensure that what you're doing is sort of shareable. Because the other thing, as I've mentioned, is yep. that Gen Z, they're, they're on TikTok, they're on all these social channels, and they use these social channels and this information as a way to communicate. Um, so if you want things to spread among this generation, ensure that it's, it's easily shareable. Thanks. There's a few questions um, coming in in the, uh, in the chat. Um, one specifically addressed to Andrea. Um, what is your advice on how to navigate internal stakeholders who believe that communicating to government is the most critical aspect of crisis as they change policy, especially when we know uh, that many Gen Zs or millennials have very passionate views or opposition to elected leaders? I, I know you're advising companies on this now. What would your advice to, to, to this uh, participant be? I mean, it's, it's a great question and it goes back to the company's priorities in that moment in, right. in part, you know, when you're thinking about license to operate and everything else. Um, so I, again, I would go back to like ensuring that it's a deliberate process and that you have the right stakeholders at the table because we've all been part of those conversations having been in-house and now an agency where it's that one voice, typically legal, <laughs> that leads the way. Um, and they may not understand that reputational risk that does create long-term um, repercussions as well. And so bringing in that data to show that, you know, yes, this government official is really important or these are the aspects that are important, but at the same time, we risk losing this many customers. That, that's, that's really critical for people to understand that these are choices to be made. There's no middle of the road at this point, in my view. It's very, very difficult to find that, even on issues like voting, for example. And so it does mean you're going to have to make calculations. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to come back to digital specifically, um, perhaps one for Denise, maybe, maybe Amanda. But just in terms of the planning, and preparation. One of one of Dave's slides that he spoke to uh, was about the sort of evolution of the planning process and what we need need to do from sort of social audits, etc., to to understand what our stakeholders are doing, where they're consuming information. How has the sort of digital element of crisis changed? Um, Denise, is there perhaps you first, and then Amanda? I mean, digital uh, digital is a pretty is it's like everything now, right? Um, like I said before, you could sort of pick up the phone, you had time, there is no time now. Yeah. Um, and so we have to constantly, I, what I try to do is, is guide our, our team and our cross-functional team of people who would be involved if a crisis arises to have a point of view before we have to, um, or have, have a plan before it become, we, we get asked. Um, so, I mean, a lot of times that involves doing prep work that we never have to use. And that's that's fine because that <laughs> that kind of peace of mind, knowing that if something does come up, we are fully prepared to handle it, is great. When I say fully prepared, I don't mean we've got this manufactured response. Mm -hmm. I just mean that we're answering the questions and giving people the information that they need in an accurate way when they want it. So, um, digital is I, I actually do appreciate a lot of sort of old fashioned. Um, communications channels, like we have a blog and it's on Medium, right? We've got a Medium blog, but oftentimes when a crisis is unfolding and it's chaotic and information is spreading like wildfire in the social channels, um, we're able to just get the full story out and let people know what's happening and what they can and can't do on the platform because of the evolving international laws and regulations. And it's a very clear way to drive people from the social channels to that Medium blog. And we found that the, you know, if we're getting an influx of press inquiries as well on the topic, we've found that it's 
been the most helpful thing to do for all of those audiences. Okay. And to, to dovetail on that, what I would say around digital, um, and just, you know, my, my point of view is that you need to understand Gen Z. And how I think of digital is that they're the newfound uh, public square. Um, and as Denise mentioned, it's, it's public square, but 10 times more, uh, more broad, 10 times more easily shared, more immediate. Um, and when you think about who the audience on those public squares are on those social channels, it's disproportionately Gen Z. Uh, yeah. So for me, the key is really understanding their motivators and what they're going to talk about, because that's the unlock to understanding who drives these, these public conversation and who drives conversations in a crisis moment. And Hugh, I would be remiss if I didn't say that from a labor uh, issues perspective, some of the best masters of using digital social are labor unions. Uh, yeah. When I think of nurses unions, for example, I mean, they are absolute masters at targeting, reaching, connecting, on uh, making ideas go beyond viral to, you know, creating movements. So, you know, our clients, we advise them, they ha we have to stay ahead of the um, this genius use of social by unions. Guys, um, thank you so much. Um, the last half an hour sort of whizzed by. Um, uh, thank you all for your wonderful insights, um, particularly Denise for joining us. Um, to just give us that client lens, a fascinating set of issues in front of you. Um, it, and, and amazing to hear that you've got such a diverse group of people who are, who are now in place, building on the, the great work that you're doing and, uh, and responding uh, to some of the issues of the day. So thank you so much, Denise, and uh, to Andrea, Amanda, and Sydney. Thank you also for your participation. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joined. I think we've had a really good turnout and hopefully it was useful for you. Um, you can get the uh, all of the data um, at the Edelman website. And uh, if anyone wants to follow up specifically with any members of the panel, then please do. Um, but I wanted to thank you all for your time um, and um, have a good rest of the day. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Bye.